Hi everyone. So earlier this year, I was very lucky to share a stage with Ben Okri. Ben Okri won the Booker Prize a couple decades ago for The Famished Road. And the theme of that night, it was just the two of us on stage, the theme for that night was the bar in literature. And we were told that we should read from our books for about 10 to 15 minutes, similar to the instructions that I was given tonight. And Ben very graciously said, you know, Sarah, you go first. So I was very nervous, as I am nervous tonight, to speak in the context of all these great writers. And I did exactly what I was supposed to do, and I read from my novel, Bar Scenes. And then Ben comes on the stage, and he talks, you know, about drinking in antiquity, and he reads a poem from someone, and another poem from someone, and he rambles, and then he eventually gets to his reading. And I thought, that's so cool. The next time I'm doing something on a theme, I'm going to do a Ben Opry, and just, you know, ramble. Um, so I'm going to ramble. I'll stay within the time restrictions, though. Um, I'm going to ramble a little bit because I want to tell you about the story that I was going to write. When I heard this theme on gods and dogs, I thought, okay, I've got to write a short story on this theme. And the image that first came to mind was about two years ago, I was in Nigeria, and I was on a book tour in Nigeria. And um, I remember walking around in the capital, anywhere, I don't know if any of you have been to Abuja, and walking around in the residential area, and there are lots of mansions and fortresses that are being built in Abuja. And I remember passing one house which had very high security walls and an electric fence on the top and lots of dogs. I couldn't actually see the dogs, but I could hear them barking. And I remember passing the gate and seeing a sign on the gate that said, this house is protected by God. And I remember just laughing to myself and thinking, well, it's protected by God. Why do you need all this other fortification? <laughs> so I thought I'd write a story that somehow incorporated that. And then I also thought about a lot of my African friends who come to San Francisco and they're rather bemused by all these great Danes, and these big dogs that people keep in these tiny apartments and people follow along the streets with their little plastic bags to pick up their stuff. And, you know, so I thought I'd weave all that stuff together. But then I started reading a book, I don't know if any of you have read this book by Amara Lacousse, it's called Clash of Civilizations Over an Elevator in Piazza Vittorio. And it's a brilliant book, and it deals a lot with dogs and gods, and I thought, oh well, he's already done that, so I can't really write that story. So anyway, while all this was mulling around in my mind, um, I was also writing another short story. I was asked by a photographer in London to write a short story for a still life image, that he had, a picture he had taken. And it's a picture of empty shelves. And so this is the story that I'm going to read for you tonight. The story is entitled Morayo. This year, she buys a pair of red suede shoes. They are not cheap, but they're gorgeous. They have a sensible wedge heel with a peekaboo toe. And on the outside, they are a deep scarlet red. It's a big birthday this time which is why she matches the shoes with a black chiffon dress and her double string of pearls. She doesn't own a full-length mirror, so she climbs onto the ledge of the bath and holds firmly to the edge of the door to balance. This way, she sees both the shoes and the dress in the bathroom mirror. She twists for a better side view, admiring her posture. She's lucky, they say, that a neighbor heard her fall. She is lucky to be alive. But luck, she feels, is not the right word. Not when her spine is broken and she must lie in bed for an indeterminate time at the Good Life residential home. Now she spends her days yearning for the familiarity and comfort of her old place. At night, she rarely sleeps. Her neighbors down the hall have nightmares, and the nurses are noisy as they bustle up and down in their loose cotton trousers and rubber-soled shoes. She tries blocking her ears, but that doesn't help. And often, when she's just about to fall asleep, that's when the pipes in her room start to creak and wheeze. She longs for someone to open a window to stop the brittle heat from drying out her eyes and nose but she feels vulnerable lying on her back 
so doesn't ask for help. Instead, she waits for daylight as it drags its reluctant feet behind the smell of burnt toast that slips in every morning through the space at the bottom of her door. She closes her eyes and inhales deeply in order to summon the smell of moi moi and akara with ogi or even porridge. Porridge would be nice, she whispers, as Goldilocks comes to mind. At lunchtime and dinner, it's almost always boiled potatoes. And once again, she wills her senses into tasting something else. She imagines fresh fettuccine with grated parmesan and shavings of pink peppercorns, or Madame Cotto's spicy chicken pepper soup with jollof rice and fried plantains. And then comes Mrs. Sen's curries, pilafs, naan, broti, apple crumble and creme fraiche, followed by Peter Rabbit's chamomile tea. If only she had her books. In her study back home, there are rows and rows of books, stacked from floor to ceiling. The books that used to belong to her mother now live at the top. And at the very top, in the tiny shelves hidden behind the glass doors, are all her old Beatrix Potters and Teddy Robinsons, still waiting, 60 years on, for children. Her cookery books and magazines sit at the bottom, and everything else lives in between. She used to keep some books apart on a separate shelf, but all that changed when Azima from Things Fall Apart and Nyasha from Nervous Conditions hopped off the shelves on the eve of Nigeria's Golden <coughs> Jubilee to complain. They told her they were tired of living on the same old row with minor characters in sad stories. What they wanted, more than anything else, was to sit next to happier women, gutsy women, and women from around the world. So she obliged and moved them all around. Later, she did away with alphabetical ordering altogether and grouped her books around characters. And this was how Shakespeare's Ophelia found Tolstoy's Anna Karenina and Grossman's Aura became acquainted with Gordimer's women. And with this new arrangement came the idea for her new book. She would take her favorite minor characters, Ezima et al., and transform them into larger-than-life women who would challenge all those grumpy old men of Barnes, Roth, and Kutsia, now sitting on the bottom shelves. But first, she must read through her books and find the thick pencil marks made as a young student and the thin tips added in later years. She must stumble across her old receipts, postcards, and dried flowers that once served as bookmarks and now as reminders of times past. She must hold them and feel them, some old, yellow, and crinkly, others young and glossy, hardly broken in, like her once upon a time. To Tom Harris, the mess in which he finds the old lady's books is a reflection of her state of mind. They are strewn haphazardly across the shelves, some with spines facing inward, others facing out. Nothing is ranged alphabetically. And like abandoned children's toys, he discovers many tucked away in clothes drawers and cupboards. Added proof for that unrelenting social worker that his court appointment as legal conservator is not only needed, but timely. There is no space in his client's new facility for all these books, but he will keep a few with which to decorate her room at the good life. He tries to imagine what a woman of her age and background might like. He chooses two books by Maya Angelou, as he's heard of her, as well as several books from the civil, like, civil rights era, her era. He also adds the complete works of Shakespeare, which he finds sitting on her desk. The rest he will have to sell. He hires a student to help him and tells her, because she's attractive, that she can keep a book or two if she'd like. And he informs her that his client used to be a writer, a famous writer, he adds, in the hope of enlivening what will surely be a dull afternoon for this sports science major from San Francisco State. 
And later, he hears a student whispering on her phone, she's got to be hella famous because she's got all these signed copies in different languages. He's pleased to have made the student's job so exciting. At the estate sale, the book buyer doesn't let on that some of the books are rare and valuable. There are signatures from Baldwin and Sartre and Virginia Woolf. He asks if the woman came from Africa, as this would explain the presence of many of the original Heinemann African Writers series, all signed. But Mr. Harris doesn't seem to know, and so the book buyer leaves it at that. He pays a token amount for the 16 boxes, and on his way home, phones a friend at Sotheby's. Now all that remains with Mr. Harris are some children's books, a few contemporary novels, and a box full of dictionaries. Jasper, who turns up at the end of the morning, is happy to be given the children's books for free, which he'll sell on 24th Street to the kind women who always give him a couple of dollars and listen to his stories of Vietnam. He also takes the dictionaries and is delighted to find a $20 bill tucked in the page beginning with legacy. He sees this as a sign and goes through all the other pages, hoping. Of the last two remaining boxes, one eventually finds its way to a doctor's reception, where pregnant women browse half-heartedly through the assortment of magazines and novels. The second box is left out on the street with a sign that says, for free. But cookery books are not popular, except to teenage boys who appreciate the weight of these books and use the box as a prop for skateboard tricks until the cops arrive and tell them to move on. Morayo is thrilled when Tom brings her some books, at last, but waits until he leaves before examining what he has brought. She is puzzled when she finds the Shakespeare plays that don't belong to her, and even more puzzled at his choice of African-American history books that she didn't know she owned. Perhaps it's Black History Month and this is why he's brought them. She loses track these days of the time of the year, but if she can remember, she must ask him about the Shakespeare plays and tell him what books to bring next time. She'll ask him for the books on the middle two shelves, closest to her desk, as these are what she needs to help her with the next book. In preparation, she requests a bookshelf, imagining one like those that she has at home, but instead they bring her something barely the size of a shoe rack. She tries to hide her disappointment, but but fails as the tears come spilling out. Later, to comfort her, someone brings two teddy bears and arranges them on the empty shelf. Mariah looks at the bears and wonders how many other old women's rooms these toys have visited and how many women the bears have made sadder. She thinks of her women characters now as fragments of the new story begin to come together. When she remembers, she must tell Tom to bring those books, those books on the two middle shelves. Thank you. <laughs>